The original way that PRK was done uh, was to scrape the epithelium off with a blade, do the ablation, and then, you know, send the patient home to a dark room in agony for four or five days. PRK evolved as a procedure to something called, which is now called advanced surface ablation. And this involves setting your eye tracker before you mess up the epithelium, because obviously you have a specular surface. In order to get the Purkinje reflexes to tell you where the visual axis is, we well, gotta do it before you start messing up the visual axis surface. So you set the eye tracker. You then put a, we call this a well, and you push it onto the cornea centered on the visual axis. And into that well, you drip 20% alcohol. And alcohol dissolves hemidesmosomes, which connect the basement membrane to the strong serve to, 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 to bones. And it literally dissolves them. So when you do that and you wait 40 seconds, and then you soak it up, and then you put some BSS in there, balanced salt solution to kind of like wash out the extra, and then you soak out the BSS, you can then very, very gently, I mean without any force at all, use a blunt spatula to just push away the epithelium. Just push it away. And you push it away from that demarcated region where the um, well was. Now you've got a clean surface, and then you will do the eczema laser ablation of that clean stromal surface, Bowman's. And then at the end, you irrigate the surface to wash out all of the inflammatory components which were released from the cells that you just broke up from the ablation. And then you dry the surface, check that everything looks clean, put some antibiotic and steroid drops in, put a bandage contact lens on, that was a big advance, a bandage contact lens. Uh, and that stays in for four or five days until the epithelium is closed, and then you take the bandage contact lens out. Remember, for many years, in fact, sadly, still, some people still don't use bandage contact lenses in PRK. The bandage contact lens is 98% of the pain battle in PRK. If you put a bandage contact lens in, there's very little, little discomfort with nothing else. Uh, when we do PRK, we have a whole sheet, which I'll explain in a minute, of how we control pain. So this is that procedure. So there's the well, and we soak up the, the alcohol. See, it's, see, see how loose that epithelium is already? And then we just very, very gently, with a sponge, look at that, I'm just wiping the epithelium off because I've broken all the hemidesmosomes. Beautiful, look how specular that surface is. That's Bowman's. Bowman's is a very, very smooth, specular surface. It's beautiful. I've got a, this is, isn't quite separated, so I'm using a sort of this, this blunt spatula to just get that other area just opened up. And make sure that the surface is homogenized in terms of hydration because water is blocked, blocks eczema laser energy. So if the surface is asymmetrically hydrated, you can get an asymmetric ablation. And then we do the ablation. This is a flying spot eczema laser with an eye tracker. And that is evaporating one quarter of a micron per pulse. And it's pulsing 250 times a second with an eye tracker that's detecting the edge pupil 1,000 times a second and correcting the position of each shot. You see the roughness of the stromal surface where Bowman's is missing. And we just wash away all of the inflammatory components and pop some antibiotics on. Steroid, anti prophylactic antibiotics, and we put a bandage contact lens on the eye.
Okay, so that's that's um, that's that's how easy it looks. Let's talk about the science of this slightly because <coughs> there's this big debate all the time about what's better, PRK or LASIK. And the simple answer is that PRK is the perfect procedure from the surgeon's perspective. You see how, I mean, easy it is to do that, right? It's pretty, you know, compare that to a membrane peel on the back of a retina with gas injected at the eye and all that stuff. LASIK, however, is the perfect procedure from the patient standpoint because you see really well straight away a little bit of grittiness while the edge of that flap seals over over the next two to three hours. Bob's your uncle, it's over. Hmm. So you see the problem though is that, and they'll say, well, late, you know, PRK might be perfect for the surgeon, but there's more pain, slower visual recovery, and more haze, which is a euphemism for scar, which is disorganized stroma. And LASIK, of course, has no pain, fast visual recovery, and no haze. However, they say PRK has no flap complications, and you have less dry eye, and you're less likely to develop ectasia if you missed a form for us keratoconus. Well, in LASIK, we can Although we have flap complications and it's more dry eye and more ectasia if we miss keratoconus, there are things that we've done each camp to make theirs better. So for example, to get the pain going, you cool the surface with cool BSS, you, um, they say, put the epithelium back on and then a bandage contact lens. You can manipulate growth factors or anti-growth factors and anti-inflammatory agents, and then there's this thing called epilasic, where you use a blunt microkeratome to scrape the epithelium off as a layer, do their ablation, and put the epithelium live back on the cornea, and then the bandage contact lens. And this is all the sort of science that was done around PRK during the, the years, the, during the 2000s. And I say science because, as I will show, it's all conjecture, and when the science was done, it turned out none of putting epithelium back ever, ever did what it was supposed to do. And we're back to advanced surface ablation. Now, the LASIK group um, says, well, you know, the flap complications are really due to a lack of expertise, because if you're very expert, these are minimal, and now we've invented a femtosecond laser to create the flaps, which makes them even less likely. And we have epithelium for screening for keratoconus. So we're highly unlikely to operate on an eye that has fun for us keratoconus. And we're looking at the back surface shape as well. And we're using much thinner flaps, which we can create using a femtosecond laser. So it kind of makes the difference between LASIK and PRK in terms of tissue removal much, much less. Because you make a super thin flap, it's almost like PRK, because that's how, because the thin flap is so thin. Now, all of the techniques that were uh, modified for PRK, for surface ablation, um, are here. And, um, you know, like I said, first we scraped, then we used alcohol, ASA. So let's look at the techniques where you don't put the epithelium back first. And uh, what I've done is a literature review of the 16 papers that compare alcohol removal of the, epi of the epithelium with trans-epithelial PRK. And I've um, basically classified them in terms of the outcomes, how much haze is developed, whether how, how much pain there is, and how fast the visual recovery came. Because the trans-PRK people say that the outcomes are better, the haze is less, the pain is less, and the recovery is faster. And what this has done, it's created a wave of surgeons around the world doing trans-PRK and saying it's better than LASIK. And maybe it's a little bit slower than LASIK, but it's almost the same as LASIK. People are saying really well on day one, and you don't have all the complications of LASIK. The same arguments, basically. So here's four more studies, and here's another nine. And when we look at all of them together, this is all 16, out of the studies, this is kind of very, sort of, this isn't a meta-analysis, this is just like a rough cut, like, review. Well, the outcomes were the same between putting, uh, taking the epithelium off with alcohol or 
taking off the laser in three quarters of the studies. The haze rates were the same in two thirds. But yes, the pain was less in, uh, and, the, and the recovery was faster in the trans-PRK group. Easily explained. If you're going trans-PRK, you're only removing the epithelium from the zone that you're making the ablation of the, to correct the refractive error. Whereas, I put a big fat, you know, eight millimeter well in there, and I take away eight millimeters of epithelium, even if I'm gonna use a six millimeter zone, um, you know, uh, treatment. So yeah, you can understand why it's gonna be faster, okay? And perhaps there's something to cutting the edges of the epithelium sharp and then having the epithelium grow back faster than having kind of rough edges with a bit of, you know, slightly dead epithelium from the edges where the alcohol killed the epithelium. I, who knows, this is a pharmacological reason. Fine, no problem. But these are 15 random profiles out of 110 eyes. And what you see is that sometimes the epithelium has a donut shape in the normal individual. So if you're going through the epithelium, where are you gonna break through first? In the middle, where it's thinner. So you're gonna start taking stroma out from the middle and not from the periphery. And then finally, when you've removed all of the epithelium, then you start taking stroma from the periphery. Well, a myopic ablation is more tissue from the center than the periphery. So you've got your minus five programmed, but now you've got the difference between the first breakthrough in the middle and when you start taking tissue from the periphery as another bit of myopic correction. So it's obviously gonna work less well. You're gonna end up with too much myopic correction in that eye. Here's an eye that has a saddle-shaped epithelium. So it's thinner top and bottom and flat thick across. That's a cylindrical shape. So you're gonna start taking stroma from above and below before this axis. That's called an astigmatic correction. So this time you're going to induce cylindrical, unplanned cylindrical correction. So here's what we did. We looked at the power, so we can calculate the power through all of these epitheliums. Like, imagine that the epithelium is a contact lens sitting on the strobe. We can use what's called wavefront analysis to calculate the power of these lenses. And it turns out that only 26% of these eyes have no refraction in the epithelium. Most of them are, of course, within a half diopter, but some of them are quite plus, and some of them are quite minus. So let's say that 88% are within a half diopter. So in 88% of the eyes, your trans-epithelial ablation will not alter the refraction post-op from what you intended. Well, if you're not a scientifically oriented surgeon and you don't measure your outcomes, which most don't, they discharge the patient at three months and see you later, you won't know if you hadn't compared a trans-PRK to regular PRK, where you're not introducing the variable of the epithelial profile, you wouldn't know that you would have been more accurate if you hadn't gone trans-epithelially in 12% of the eyes, and some of them are 0.75, and the patient doesn't come back because they think they're seeing well anyway. So you gotta be scientific about this to know what to do. So back to this concept of one versus the other, the big PRK defense, like the last, the big defense system is, oh, there's less dry eye. Dry eye is ocular discomfort. Let's look at that. Well, there is one prospective, randomized, controlled trial of thin flap LASIK in one eye and PRK as an advanced surface procedure in the other. There is one. It's hard to do this because these are paying patients. And so, you know, why would you submit to a clinical trial, right? But they did it. And a big credit to Steve Slade, Dan Dury, and Perry Binder for doing this. At the one month visit, the eyes that it had surface ablation had more discomfort than the LASIK eyes. Well, that's obvious. Um, the subdomen's keratomalusis, this thin flap LASIK, was less painful, but by a factor of five, 
at one month. It was 25 within the first week, but five to one within the first month, and two to one at three months, although that, they didn't have enough eyes to show significance. With LASIK, it was less painful. The visual recovery, this is um, the, the rating of the vision by the patient versus time. You can see that it took three months, three to six months, for patients to see that their eyes were seeing the same. PRK obviously much slower, well that's obvious. But if you look at scatter within the cornea, this is a device that injects a beam of light and as it comes out, it measures the spread of that point, a point spread function. And so it's an objective measure of light scatter. And the, the scatter measurements were obviously much better for LASIK than they were for PRK earlier on. And still, even at six months, uh, LASIK had less scatter than PRK. So on these two, on the, on, on, on the comparison of not putting the epithelium back, advanced surface ablation has more scientific justification for it than trans-PRK. Even though there might be a little less pain in the fascia, fa faster wound closer, the, the results cannot possibly be the same. No one's done the head-to-head uh, -head study. I wouldn't do it because it's like you, I know that ha some of the eyes are going to end up off, ta off target. I think it's kind of like an unethical study in a way. All you have to do is look at the epithelial profiles and then not do the study because you can see that it's going to induce random refractive errors on the trans-PRK side. So the other one is putting the epithelium back. And this is called LASIK. And this is brilliant marketing. Marketing is very important in refractive surgery. And LASIK is a brilliant term because it makes it sound like LASIK, but it's actually PRK. And then they make it look like LASIK by putting the epithelium back. It's like, oh, they put the flat back. Oh, well, it is the same, isn't it? No, you're putting back, in this case, dead epithelial cells because you alcoholized them. And then here, you're putting back live epithelium. So it'll stick back, right? It'll stick right back down again. Those hemidesmosomes will just go, hey man, we're alive. We're going to anchor down to this Bowman's right now. Not. The meta-analyses show that there are no differences in outcome between uh, putting the epithelium uh, back and not putting the epithelium back. Now, this paper, uh, Heather Baldwin was one of John Marshall's fellows, and she wrote this fantastic review article. So it's not even that long, by the way. It's only like eight pages. But if you want to understand the, the chemistry, the biochemistry and the wound healing of PRK, she, she, did, all, she did about three months' work for you and summarize it in eight pages. It's a beautiful article. This picture is from her article with all of these factors that are involved in all the different phases of PRK wound healing. And his other fellows, who are now very senior ophthalmologists, Christoph is in Germany, these guys are in the UK, Madhavan and Ramesh, and this is John up here. Um, they did a lot of this science using an artificial chamber which they devised so that they can keep an eye alive, a cornea alive, for a month. And so they could do incisions, or they could do PRK, or LASIK, or LASIK in an eye and watch it heal. Or they could, you know, a, a bank eye. And they could sacrifice the bank eye, because it wasn't alive, but I mean, it, you know, and do histology or biochemical analysis of the interleukins and whatever. And so they did a lot of science on this during the 1990s. And those, these are the fellows that did this. Now one of the things, so here's a PRK healing over 120 hours. And here's a LASIK healing, right? The epithelium's been put back. These are transillumination photos showing the epithelium growing back under the flap of live epithelium. These are live epithelial cells, but they're being undermined by new epithelial cells. And you can see that scrunching in underneath, like putting a sheet in underneath a blanket. Yeah? And it turns out that they prove that the, it never does reattach. It just gets replaced. And, you know, irony is that 100 years ago, in the First World War, it was clear to surgeons that putting dead tissue on a wound was a bad thing. And yet here you have eye surgeons putting dead tissue on a wound as a good thing.
so this, the science around the wound healing of PRK um, that John did with his fellows, were, and they, all these guys, each of these was a, like a PhD each, right? So one of the things was obviously you've got the hemidesmosome rupture um, by the alcohol. And of course now the damage that you do is cytokine released, the carot keratocyte activation. And it turns out when the whole story was put together that the increasing cell death, right? Number of, like number of dead cells within the flap or of epithelium. So if you just had your control eyes, there was very little cell death within that layer. If you used alcohol, there was 100% cell death within the layer. If you used 100%, if you used 20% alcohol, there was less cell death within the epithelium. And if you didn't put alcohol, you just scraped the epithelium off as a layer, well, you didn't get that much cell death in that layer. So they were showing what you'd expect with respect to epithelial survival in these different ways of doing it. But the interesting thing was that in terms of the proliferation of keratocytes, which then produce haze and pain, it turns out that obviously the uninjured cornea has very little keratocytes. The totally killed epithelium, more, when you put some live cells back, you actually get even more keratocyte activation. And when you put fully live epithelium back, you get tons more keratocyte activation. So it turns out that the science of LASIK produced the exact opposite result to what the unscientific refractive surgeons were proposing as the reason for doing LASIK, which is less pain, less haze. <laughs> Turns out that if you put live epithelium that's broken up and it's gonna degrade and, and, and just gradually die off, you're putting a reserve of extra inflammatory epithelium to feed this fire underneath, as opposed to putting dead epithelium, which, yeah, well, they're dead cells and they have to gotta be removed by your macrophages, but you know, you're not like adding you're not, literally not squirting lighter fluid on the fire as you would be with putting live epithelium there that can continuously provide more inflammatory components as more in cells, more and more cells die. One of the advantages that John thought would be provided by the science in terms of LASIK was that, you see, if you don't put the epithelium back, the, you, know, you get your keratocyte loss and then you get your migration and activation. So that process took about 10 days without putting the epithelium back, but it took 14 days if you did put the epithelium back. So he said, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. There could be a benefit to putting the epithelium back. It's a, bar a, it's a barrier. So you'll get the surface healing before the epithelium comes back and causes the activation of myofibroblasts. So by disengaging the, 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 the activation from the interleukins and, 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 and growth factors from the dead epithelial cells, by disengaging the two, the wound healing of the stroma from the wound healing of the epithelium, you're separating the two temporally, you might get less haze. Well, that didn't pan out. So, the disadvantages of PRK are dealt with, obviously, by you know, managing pain. And one of the great advances in PRK pain management, apart from this is what we give uh, uh, in a bag, um, but we also give dilute anesthetic. Actually, there was a perspective, this is another PhD student of John Marshall's who did this study and showed that anesthetic, if used in controlled doses, does not delay epithelial wound healing. And so you can use dilute anesthetic and keep patients completely comfortable. In our patients, 95% of the patients are completely pain free and don't even use the dilute anesthetic because of the bandage contact lens. And 5% use the anesthetic, dilute anesthetic quite frequently. It's 0.1% approximately. Uh, and 1% despite, despite anything are uh, described pain, but maybe that's just psychological, endogenous, low threshold type people. 
Um, and that was presented, by the way, in Arvo, 1995. So this is like old stuff, and yet it still hasn't reached the vernacular of the vast majority of surgeons. Um, well, let me show you this cool case, because this is kind of cool. Um, so I had a patient who had, um, P I did PRK on her because her corneas were too thin to do the minus eight correction under a microkeratone flap, Could, couldn't control how thin it could be. And many years later, about three years later, she came back to me saying, well, I'm really short-sighted again. Well, I thought, oh, she has ectasia. Oh, no, I missed it. Well, no, we scanned her, and she had this ultrasound picture in the center of this very hazy, reticular haze pattern. And I was like, wait a minute, did I do PRK or LASIK in this patient? Because I see the front surface here, and I see Bowman's here. Well, the stromal surface there, not Bowman's, because I took a Bowman's away. This is Bowman's, sorry. Then Bowman's stops here and stops there because that was the ablation zone. But this is the stromal surface up here, and there's another interface here. So that's one interface, and that's the other interface. And what's this in between? It's this. It's the disorganized new stroma laid down by myofibroblasts. Now why, three years after PRK, has she suddenly produced a layer of stroma out of the blue? Well, because she went to Barbados for three weeks. And it turns out that Bowman's probably does have a function. And it turns out that in the area where Bowman's was missing, she laid down new stroma and became minus three again from the minus eight. So instead of removing tissue from the center to correct the myopia, tissue was added by her own cornea, UV, keratocyte activation, myofibroblasts, new, new stroma laid down, myopic again. And so what we did was we ablated that layer out with an eczema laser and used mitomycin C to stop any myofibroblasts from proliferating and laying down new stroma. And she ended up with a clear cornea again and back to plano. And she was advised, as I now advise anybody who has PRK, you must always use UV protection because you have a chance of, re, uh, 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 of activating your myofibroblasts. And it turns out that that's another reason why PRK is not a great procedure compared to LASIK because the permanent removal of Bowman's, which was for many years thought to be bad, and then in the 90s, suddenly it's not bad, thanks to PRK you know, becoming a commercial juggernaut. Turns out it is a disadvantage to not have a Bowman's because you're now susceptible to UV activation for the rest of your life. Uh, the risk of wound delay closure, it, 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 epithelium not closing, it happens in about 1% of patients. And we have to go through some, it's almost like a neurotrophic ulcer, because it actually is, because you cut a lot of the nerves, and everything is nonged, and, and, and the ultraviolet radiation kills a lot of the superficial plexus of the, uh, of the cornea, and you need acetylcholine from the corneal nerve plexus to make the cells migrate to the center. It's part of the food that epithelium needs to migrate. And so we have to use the same principles, amniotic membranes, autologous serum, or um, platelet-rich plasma drops to try and activate the epithelium from growing in, and it's the same sort of thing. Risk of infection, of course, very, very low, but it's lower with LASIK than it is with PRK for obvious reasons. The LASIK wound is 20 seconds open, then it's shut, that's it. That's the opportunity for bugs to get in. Or maybe later they go splash some river water on their eyes before the epithelium closes and they get an amoeba infection. But this is unlikely, right? Whereas with PRK, you have several days of a wound under a bandage contact lens and there is an opportunity for infection. The way that I think we need to look at this, and rather than some people saying PRK is better and LASIK is better, let's, be, let, let, let's just be clear about the, the facts here. This is scientific facts. I've just shown you a lot of conjecture and rubbish about what is said about different kinds of PRK. So you can see how confusing the, the market is. The way I see it is that if you're a novice refractive surgeon, novice, you should start with PRK. If you're a general ophthalmologist who does a bit of refractive surgery, uh, you probably should be doing PRK. I mean, 
you get away with it because the complication rate is quite low with LASIK now with, my, with you know, flaps being created by femtosecond lasers, but microfolds, I, you know what? I mean, if you really want a stress-free life, load all of the, the inconvenience at the front the first week, and then you have very little to worry about afterwards. Most expert refractive surgeons do very little PRK, very little, because what I've said for the last half hour. But I do it as a therapeutic procedure. If someone has basement membrane dystrophy with recurrent erosion syndrome, well, obviously I'm going to use one stone to kill two birds, obviously. But the chances of losing two lines is still lower with LASIK than PRK because of the wound healing is much less complex. And this is for similar ranges, by the way, and this is my whole career put together. So that's 16,000 primary LASIK procedures and 350 PRK procedures um, matched.